Hi everybody, Professor King here. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Tony, Tony Morrison's text, Unspeakable Things Unspoken. Uh, and at the end, I will uh, discuss its relationship to uh, Zora, Neale, Zora Neale Hurston's short story, Sweat. Um, so I'll take it to a share screen in just a moment. Um, as always, I remind you that when you are uh, watching these videos and taking notes uh, to pause frequently as you're taking notes so that the information can be absorbed. If any questions come up, please feel free to ask those either via email, um, Instagram, my, my Zoom office hours, or you know, however else you get a hold of me. So um, I'll take it on a share screen now. So this is Toni Morrison from Unspeakable Things Unspoken, um, as the text says. And so we're just going to dive right in. Um, but before we get into too much depth, because this is a little bit of a longer theoretical reading, um, I want you to consider the following quote from the text. And this is from Toni Morrison herself. This is Toni Morrison here in this photo. Um, she, she just passed away, a, a, I want to say about a year or two years ago. Um, so this is her when, when she was um, a little bit younger, um, kind of like at the, at the acme of her writing career. I mean, she was always at the acme of her writing career, but when she first was getting really big. Anyway, um, so Morrison says, but to question the very notion of white progress, the very idea of racial superiority, of whiteness as privileged place in the evolutionary ladder of humankind, and to meditate on the fraudulent, self-destroying philosophy of that superiority, to pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges, to drag the judge himself to the bar. That was dangerous, solitary, radical work, especially then, especially now. Um, so if we think about this reading, you know, Morrison goes through all of these ways in which Africanness, um, African art, African American art, how those things have been suppressed, have been dehumanized or sort of denied, right? And so in this quote, we kind of see the source of why that is, right? This fraudulent white superiority that, as she points out, right, doesn't just destroy, um, doesn't just seek to destroy blackness and black culture but destroys itself right so let's think about let's take a moment to kind of pause and think about that quote because i think this is a good place to start in terms of again this kind of dense complex more challenging reading and also um you know start thinking about that in terms of the short story sweat um you know who is in the story um on whom does the story center? Uh, what issues, what language, what concerns are presented in Zora Neale, Neale Hurston's sweat um, that might have something to do with this quote? So a couple of premises that Morrison uh, presents in Unspeakable Things Un Unspoken, the thing that is unspeakable is race, right? And we see this, you know, like in the picture, like we, we, uh, we see this um, all over our society and, and it's being challenged in certain ways, right? Like with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the various protests that we've seen um, in, in recent months and years, um, but largely, right, in a lot of arenas and a lot of realms, it's still an unspeakable thing. And if you even think about like protest, right, or Black Lives Matter, there's still a backlash to that that wants to keep race an unspeakable thing. There's still people who will say like, oh, they're just social justice warriors or, oh, they're just, you know, whining about their, their rights. Or even like there's a, a ballot on the measure right now in 2020, um, you know, to kind of... Um, repeal a previous act on affirmative action, right? So that um, we can make sure that we are sort of making the playing field more equitable for, you know, 
uh, people of color and women and people with disabilities, people who have been historically, um, again, uh, discriminated against, suppressed, dehumanized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, the, all of those, in, in other words, all of those backlashes, right, all of those, all of those negative responses are in a sense ways of keeping these things unspeakable, right? But Morrison is focusing, focusing specific, specifically on the Western literary canon, right? She's talking about uh, the, the literary art specifically, more broadly all art, right? But mo most specifically, more specifically literary art vis-a-vis um, -vis the canon and how race is an unspeakable thing, right? And we, we'll talk more about that in a moment, right? She says, what is astonishing is not the resistance to displacement of works or to the expansion of genre within it, right? Meaning within the canon, but the virulent passion that accompanies this resistance and more important, the quality of its defense weaponry. And what you see at the beginning of this um, speech, this was actually uh, transcribed from a speech, um, is this, you know, is this allusion to defense weaponry. And I think, you know, the time that this is written um, really speaks to that, right? But also just sort of the, the militant, militaristic nature of American culture, the sort of like obsession with things like guns and violence and all of that, right? Um, she's definitely kind of pulling that out for a very specific reason and using it as symbolism and metaphor in her discussion of literature, right? Um, these, these claims against, right, or, or again, suppressing or dehumanizing the African American presence in the canon um, and its role in the canon is a kind of violence. And there's actually a word that we'll, um, we'll briefly touch on when we get to people like uh, Gaitri Spivak and Edward Said. And the term is um, epistemic violence, right? So in other words, it's not violence that's necessarily like I bring a billy club and, you know, bop you over the head and render you unconscious, right? But it's, it's, um, it's a subtle violence that's enacted in very seemingly harmless ways, right? Like through, I don't know, um, political uh, bills, right? Or through leaving people out of a literary canon or forcing, you know, uh, language immersion in schools where you can only speak one language, right? It, so it's, it's, in other words, it's a very kind of um, violent transition to these more um, white supremacist or Western ways of thinking. Um, so when she's talking, so when she's using those metaphors of weaponry, kind of be very keen and aware to that. Um, and that leads us to our next quote, which is, you know, she says, canon building and canon, right? The phonetics of, of literary canon, but also like, boom, the canon, like that blows, you know, things up. Um, you know, canon building is empire building. Canon defense is national defense. Canon debate is the clash of cultures. So this is, in other words, this isn't just about, about nerds like me sitting in a room going, what belongs in our text, right? But I, to be honest, I do that. And I'm actually like in the process of doing it right now for this very class. Um, you know, it's not just about that, but it's about if, if certain things are excluded, right? Or if certain things are elevated to sort of a higher status, then what does that mean for the other things, right? For the things that are excluded or kind of treated as if they're not as, uh, they're not as historically relevant or whatever, right? It's empire, but to, to Morrison, right? She's saying it's, this is the same as like going in and, you know, like napalming a bunch of, a bunch of uh, people who otherwise had nothing to do with a war, right? This is the same as, you know, um, you know, saying that we're going into a country, you know, to democratize them when really we're just like killing innocent civilians for oil, right? Like the, to her, it's all part of the same system, right? Um, so, Continuing on, right, she talks about how cultures seek meaning in the language and images available to, to them. Um, I know we read Hooks previously, and you'll definitely see overlap with Hooks and with Morrison. Like, that shouldn't be a stretch by any imagination. 
Um, but there's another text by Bell Hooks called On Self-Recovery. And in, in that text, Bell Hooks talks about how we're speaking through the language of the oppressor, right? We're speaking in a Western patriarchal language. And because of that, right, we can only speak, like our speech is sort of limited, right? Because these other ways of expressing ourselves have again been like suppressed or ignored or or made rendered irrelevant or whatever right so then we have to think about like what happens when a part of a culture is intentionally ignored or overlooked right how do we revisit or reclaim that culture into our reading of texts right um you know, and, and for, for, the, for this text, for Sweat, it's easier to do because we have a Black woman writer writing the text. But the challenge is like, how do we do that with texts that are, I don't know, written by straight white men from 200 years ago, right? Like 150 years ago. Um, you know, when in the longer version of this reading, Morrison challenges Edgar Allan Poe. She challenges Melville, right? She challenges even like Milan Kundera. And she says like, okay, how do we reclaim blackness or other suppressed or marginalized cultures within this, um, you know, within this history that has sought to suppress them for so long? Um, and the image I'm using here, I don't know if anyone notices this image, but there was a movie that came out a few years ago about the Stonewall Uprising. And the, um, you know, we just celebrated the 50 year uh, anniversary of the Stonewall uprising, which led to things like, um, you know, uh, pride, LGBTQ pride, higher um, awareness and visibility of LGBTQIA plus issues, trans issues, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and, but in this movie, right, who, the people who sort of lead the uprising are um, straight white guys. And that's not how it happened historically. Um, how it happened historically was a trans woman by the name, a trans woman who was also um, a sex worker by the name of Marsha P. Johnson. And, um, you know, so this sort of whitewashing of the film, right, um, is, is just one of a multitude of cultural examples when we over, when we don't just ignore or overlook, but we actively erase, right, um, those voices that have already been pushed to the margins. Right? So how do we revisit or reclaim those cultures into our readings of the text we're looking at? And again, when we talk about text, we're not just talking about short stories or poems. We're talking about films. We're talking about uh, novels. We're talking about plays. We're talking about music videos. We're talking about social media, right? Anything where there's representation. Um, we're even talking about the college campus, right? So <clears throat> according to Hooks, right, I, I've been mentioning this term suppression a lot, right, and we have to really think about how that has functioned for African-American art. Um, and there are four kind of major ways that's happened, right? One, that it just like doesn't exist, which is, you know, a very sort of horse blinders way of, uh, Western horse blinders way of seeing the world, like, oh, I'm just not going to acknowledge it. Um, that it exists, but it's inferior, right? Like these, you know, a lot of times you'll see words like primitive or barbaric or native, right? Like those are very deliberate choices of words to imply inferiority of certain groups, right? Or even of certain texts, um, exotic, right? Or, or, or even like authentic, right? Like when you think about like gentrification and people go like, oh, I want to go to an authentic Mexican restaurant. It's like, uh, there's a problem in that, <laughs> right? Like I need to sort of Columbus and colonize. I as the white person, right, need to Columbus and colonize this Mexican restaurant. Um, anyway, that's a digression, um, right? Um, also claims that such art is only superior when it's held to standards of Western tradition. And to Morrison, these standards, you know, are really like irrelevant, but also just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Arbitrary, right? Like, and a lot of them, 
when she goes back to like, you know, Egyptology and sort of like, um, you know, the sort of ripping off of Babylonian culture and things like that, you know, we see that this Western tradition has always taken from the African, right? Has always kind of um, appropriated, if we're going to use a 20th century term, right? This and called it its own. So these standards are kind of arbitrary, irrelevant, and ambiguous, right? Um, or, or the fourth way that this happens is that, you know, this African-American art and culture and literature most specifically, right, is raw genius, but it needs this Western refining, right? And so, um, and that kind of goes, that kind of scaffolds the second claim, right? That it's kind of, it's, it's a way of saying it's inferior, right? Like, because oh, it's, it's so good, but it needs this sort of refinement. And so like, we see parallels to a lot of these in the beauty industry, right? Like one, like we see like, we've seen historically a very lack of representation. So that would be like the not, ex the not existing, right? Um, that it exists, but it's inferior. We see that in things like colorism or just in like, you know, the sort of uh, idealizing of, of the, the white, beauty i you know the white beauty standard um that it's only superior when it's held to western standards or the western tradition right and kind of like this like raw rawness that needs refining and so like a few years ago l'oreal got the the cosmetics company got into some hot water because they you know like they kind of uh lightened images of beyonce for one of their you know ad campaigns and so it, a lot of people were bothered by this because again, it was kind of this way of um, taking blackness and conforming it to sort of a white ideal, right? And granted, we can go into a months long discussion about, you know, Beyonce and that, that phenomenon and how, what, what level of a role she plays into that and what level of a role, you know, like that is, imposed upon her, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's a conversation for another day, but you know, something to think about. Um, so now will probably be a good time to pause, um, but on your own, you should be thinking about the following. Um, what you see as sort of Morrison's overall argument or theory, right? Always, that's what we're always looking at in these texts and then apply this to something beyond the text. Like I've given a few examples here of, of more of like the claims, right? If we're talking about like um, the parallel of like a college essay, which you're all writing this week, we. Um, but I want you to think of your own, like where you see this, some of these things that Morrison's talking about, where you see this either in your lives or the real world, right? Or news or Instagram or wherever, right? And then I want you to look at other passages, ones that I haven't mentioned that you highlighted and annotated and grappled with and think about ones that you agreed with, that you disagreed with, why you agreed or disagreed, the extent to which you agreed or disagreed, right? Because it's not black or white no pun intended, but it's, you know, sometimes it's like, well, I see this point, but here's where they lose me or whatever, right? Um, so think about those things, maybe pause right here, and then in a moment, I'll move on to the next slide. And then think about what we've read so far and think about the, you know, the, the idea of theory as an ongoing historical conversation. And, you know, just take a few minutes yourself to put Morrison in conversation with some of these writers we've already read, right? Like clearly if she's talking about the canon, we go, oh, well, Eliot, right? Tradition and the individual talent, because that's the sort of focus of, of that reading, right? So what might each say to the other about canon formation and about who belongs in that canon, right? Especially if you go back to the video that I did on Eliot and what we know about Eliot and Eliot's own, let's just say issues with certain races, right? Um, but beyond that, right? Like 
what Elliot has to say about tradition, about the artist, about how, what the artist suppresses in herself, right? Like, and, and what Morrison might have to say about that. It's worthwhile. Um, also, Gilbert and Gubar, right? Um, do you see parallels between this dehumanizing suppression, discrimination toward uh, the African and African American tradition and, and people of African descent th th themselves and kind of G Gilbert and Gubar's discussion of how women have been you know, made sick by our society or made to feel crazy by our society or things like that. Do you see any parallels there? Um, or Freud, right? Um, some of you in the, in the, you know, in the essay discussions on Zoom and in the notes and stuff, I mentioned like Lovecraft Country, if any of you have been watching Lovecraft Country. And, you know, Lovecraft Country is this great <laughs> marrying of people like Morrison and Hooks and Freud, right? Because, you know, it, it really goes into this like uncanny or unsettling quality where we're really examining what this country says it is and what it says its values are and the way it treats certain groups, right? Particularly African-Americans in this contract, in this context, right? Um, so I don't know why I'm saying suppression so much. I think it's just on my brain. I've been watching the Nexium documentary and they use that word a lot. But anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so think about, you know, this, the uncanny or unsettling or maybe even the defamiliarizing elements that we see here. Um, and then maybe think about Foucault, right? What Foucault has to say about power relationships, about what we do in terms of confining and concealing certain members of our society that we deem, you know, aberrant or whatever, and how they relate um, and how, you know, sexuality and race kind of might have some similarities, right? Um, so think about those, maybe pause here for a few moments and just jot some ideas down. And I promise this is not straight vodka, it's just water. All right, next step. So Let's think a little bit about Zora Neale, Neale Hurston's sweat, right? We have this story about this woman, right? Delia, and then we have Sykes, and we have Bertha, we have the men at the country store, right? Um, but think about certain things within the story, right? Think about, like, what, think about things like, what is, what is lacking, what's missing from this story that sometimes we see. Think about the language that's used in this story and why language might be used in the way that it is. What, what's the purpose? What's it showing us, right? Where does this take place? Um, you know, what are Delia's interests? What's her job? Who's she working for? Uh, who's she working for, right? In other words, like, who, who, from whom does she earn money? And then where does that money go? Um, how do people, how do other people who see her situation, how do they comment on her life? What do they have to say about her, right? Um, think about symbolism, right? Like if we can relate this even to something like Hawthorne, like the symbolism of a serpent. Um, think about nature and how setting plays a role in this and what this, what that might have to do with what we've been talking about. Um, you know, sorry, my dog's trying to get in the screenshot here. She's, she's freaking out. If you hear panting, that's not, that's not anything other than my dog coleslaw. Um, so think of all those things and more, whatever else came to your mind, whatever else you noticed. And then think about a couple of these quotes from Morrison. The first one being, um, cultures, whether silenced or monologistic, whether repressed or repressing, right? Um, seek meaning in the language and images available to them. What's made available to the characters in this story? What's made available, you know, maybe find out a little bit more about Zora Neale Hurston and find out like what was made available 
to her? What do we know about her? Why is she sharing this text that she's sharing? What's she trying to tell us? What is she trying to get across to us, right? When we're talking about repression or meaning or language or culture. And then the next one um, is we are the subjects of our own narrative, witnesses to and participants in our own experience. And in no way coincidentally in the experience of those with whom we have come in contact. We are not in fact other, we are choices. And to read imaginative, oh, sorry, I have to fix this real quick because it's gonna drive me crazy. A quote within a quote is just a single quotation mark. See, watch me revise as I go, just as you, when you're writing your essays, revise as you go. Isn't that just lovely and wonderful? So I'll reread this. We are the subjects of our own narrative, witnesses to and participants in our own experience and in no way coincidentally in the experiences of those with whom we have come in contact. We are not in fact other, we are choices. And to read imaginative literature by and about us is to choose to examine centers of the self and to have the opportunity to compare these centers with the quote raceless one with which we are all of us most familiar. So what I might ask, and this is a big ask, right? This is asking you to really be honest with yourselves, not just as readers, but as human beings. I want to ask you what was challenging about this reading. And I want to ask you if you perhaps struggled with it in, in a way, not maybe like understanding it, but maybe keeping your interest or maybe something else. And then ask yourself, like, does that have anything to do with what is centered as the norm, as the ideal, as the thing we want to know about, right? Um, as the thing we strive to talk about or be. And if this story doesn't somehow fit those criteria, then what does that say about us and our desire uh, in terms of what culture has done to us, right? Has made us think, feel, or act. Why do we think certain things are raceless and other things are race-based, right? Why do we think that when certain groups speak up, that they're just speaking as representatives of this group and it, ha it becomes, you know, a black thing or a women's thing or a gay thing or a trans thing, you know? Sorry, she's driving me crazy, this one. Um, you know, why, why is the thing that's not those things the invisible norm and all of those things that we've set apart as other, why are they not part of the norm? In other words, think about that quote. Listen to my dog pant also. Sorry, there's like a loud something going on and she gets really scared. So she comes and bugs me and will not leave me alone. So and I make these videos and I'm three quarters of the way through them and then I can't stop them because she's sitting here. She's just sitting here doing this, going, I'm so afraid. That's her big scary pit bull, afraid of everything she comes into contact with. Anyway, let's move on. All right, so for Hurston, um, more questions to think about in terms of Morrison and Hurston. The first one being like, does sweat deserve to be in the canon? And don't just say like, of course, yeah, sure, okay. Right, like think about why. What makes good literature and why, or bad literature, and why would this fit those criteria? And if it does deserve to be in the canon, how might it change the canon if it were included, right? And think about what Elliot argues and think about what Morrison argues. Um, another question is like, what are some parallels we can draw between Morrison, Hurston, and other writers we've read so far. I talked about comparing Morrison to other theorists, but think about like the role of serpents, right? Like think about the role of weather, right? Um, the, the way that wives and husbands interact, right? Like if we compare this to like Charlotte Perkin, Perkins Gilman, 
um, think about religion, think about, you know, all these sorts of things, jobs, um, think about virtue, power, suppression. There's that word I keep using, um, gender, race, sex, et cetera. Right. Um, all these things we've been talking about since day one. Um, and I guess, you know, take your time, pause, reflect on that. Maybe you have your own dog that's panting in your face while you're trying to focus on and, and, and really, you know, consider something. Um, but, you know, again, slow down. This isn't about speeding up. It's about slowing down and not about knowing every single word of Morrison, but about grappling with the things that, that jump out to us and applying those to Hurston and to, you know, the readings that we find interesting and, and making that meaningful, not just in our study of literature and art, but in our lives. Um, so I'll take it off, stop, share. And I guess since I always say goodbye in these videos, since I have coleslaw right here and she is the real star of the show, let's, you know, I'm not going to kid myself any longer. Um, I'll have her say goodbye tonight. So everyone just remember you can email and, uh, message me on canvas. You can come to my zoom office hours and follow me on Instagram. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns. I and Coleslaw are here to help out this panty weird dog. All right. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day or night, and I will see you in cyberspace. Bye.